Hello. Hi, everybody. Um, I just want to thank everybody who took the time out today to come and kick off Diversity and Inclusion Week 2016 with us. My name is Kim Davis, and um, this is Cindy Nover, and we are the co-chairs of the President's Committee on Diversity. Um, this is a week-long um, week -long events that we host along with um, collaborations with a lot of different clubs and departments on campus. Um, thank you guys so much for coming out and showing you care about diversity and inclusion on this campus. Um, Cindy is going to introduce our keynote speaker, Tommy Williams Jr., and I will leave that to her. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, as uh, Kim said, my name is Cindy Nover, and I have the honor of introducing our keynote speaker, Tommy Williams Jr. Uh, Tommy is originally from Chicago, uh, but uh, moved here, uh, <laughs> which is great for us. Uh, he played football for Eastern Washington University, uh, studied criminal justice here, and then later um, uh, attended Washington State University uh, and got a master's in education. Uh, he and his wife have worked, uh, Paula, have worked um, to establish programs for at-risk youth. That's some of what I assume he'll be talking to us about today. And um, uh, I should mention that he is a, a former football player here and was um, uh, drafted to play professionally uh, back in 1990, 1992, you played here, I believe. Um, so uh, his photo, as you'll see, is on uh, Roos Field here. <laughs> um, so uh, I uh, hope we can give a warm welcome today to Tommy. He'll be talking to us about um, some of his experiences working with at-risk youth. And um, Tommy was also awarded the Adult Youth Mentor Award by Unity in the Community Youth in Action. And in 2013, he was awarded the Community Leader Award by the Washington Association of School Administrators. So we have a, um, an excellent speaker here today. Uh, let's give a warm welcome to Tommy Williams, Jr. Thank you. Excellent speaker. I got to, that's some worse. I got to really try to help I can be able to back up. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm honored to be back on campus. How you doing, Dr. Finney? <laughs> um, yeah, good to see you. Really honored to be here. I, uh, first, I want to thank uh, the President and the President's Committee on Diversity and Inclusion for um, allowing this to be a topic that we should constantly be talking about and more of inclusion to making sure that we know exactly what that means. And so it's, I'm honored to be a part of this weekend to kick that off. Um, <clears throat> so when the committee asked me about my experiences growing up on the south side of Chicago, um, it was a little easy for me to think about, but at times when I think about this, it's kind of different because it wasn't normal. And when I give a lot of people little snapshots of my, me growing up, they kind of give me a look sideways like, wow, you went through that? So now I have to really um, be uh, more honored and, and, and be a, it's a blessing to be able to, to be back in Cheney and to understand why I'm here. Um, first off, I want to talk about the word diversity. And the Webster definition of diversity says it's the quality or state of having many different forms and types and ideas, et cetera. And so the other definition says the state of having people who are of different races and who have different cultures in a group and an organization. So that's diversity. That's over here. So then when we say inclusion, what does that mean? So the diversity of, you know, having diversity, but inclusion is a relation between two classes that exist, when all members of the first are also members of the second. So you can't have one without the other. And so I like to narrow it down to us all in this room. We're all human beings, right? So we're all members of the first, but then the members of the second, we're all eagles. So that means we're all inclusive in this room. So I like to talk about that as far as, you know, you can't have one without the other, diversity and inclusion. Because a lot of times people brag about, well, yeah, we have a really diverse campus, really diverse campus. Well, is it, is it, is it an, an inclusive campus? How are people able to be a part of the campus? Just because they're diverse, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're included in a lot of the policy and procedures of the campus. So that's why I wanted to make sure that we are always aware of that and knowing when we say diversity and inclusion, we have to marry those two together and not just think that they're separate. So talking about me growing up, <clears throat> Um, so I was a middle child, I was a middle boy, I had two sisters, um, no brothers, my mom and dad raised us on the south side, and um, it's very um, uh, aggressive, it's very, uh, a lot of violent crimes. Uh, this weekend, just yesterday, somebody posted on Facebook that we had 187 murders this year alone. And this past weekend, Mother's Day weekend, we had 35 
wounded, nine dead in one weekend. And so when you hear those stats, you think of, you know, Iraq, you know, Afghanistan. But these are stats that are talking about my hometown. And another thing on Fox 28 they mentioned is that a lot of parents are saying to their kids that are away at college, don't come home. And that's reminiscent of how I grew up. I mean, coming here to Cheney, my parents used to always say, okay, you come here for a week and you're going back to Cheney. Well, they would say Cheney because, you know, they really couldn't pronounce it. <clears throat> my dad would say, you're going back to Cheney as soon as you get back, you know. But nothing's changed. I mean, this was in 91, 92 when I got here. I couldn't wait to go home. But then I had to change who I was. As soon as I got off that plane to go back, I, you know, get off at Midway Airport, I had to change my whole demeanor. I couldn't walk around Chicago with the demeanor of Teeny, right? Speaking to everybody. Hey, what's up? How you doing? And first time I went home and my cousin is a barber there and go back. I had hair then. So I'll go back and get my hair cut, you know, and um, we'll go outside the shop and I'll be talking to everybody. And he's like, Tommy, man, man, you've been gone too long. Quit talking to everybody, you know? I'm like, if that's what it's about, then I'm going to go back out to the Northwest then because that's where I'm home then, you know? But growing up in Chicago, my, my parents, Tommy and Claudine, um, I'm just honored to, to be their son. Um, they sacrificed every day for my sisters and I to go to a private school. We went to St. Atherita Catholic School and um, growing up on the south side with the uniform on, you were back then, you know, nobody really wore uniforms except you had a private school. But when I had a uniform on, it was like having a big old bullseye on my head saying, beat me up because we were different. And I wasn't a fighter. Um, I wasn't in a gang. But St. Atherita was in a neighborhood that was a gang infested. It was in the heart of the south side of my neighborhood. <clears throat> but the neighborhood I grew up in was different from St. Atherita. So my neighborhood was in the Blackstone neighborhood, and St. Atherita was in the gangster disciple neighborhood. So they would see us walking across the main street, which is called Ashland, and the other gang members would see us walking from the Blackstone neighborhood. And I was a big kid. I was an overweight kid. And so they would automatically assume that I was in a gang. And um, even the, the kids my age that were the gang members from that neighborhood would be waiting on me. And so I was bullied a lot growing up. And that's one of our programs that we started with Operation Healthy Family, which I'm going to talk about later. But I was bullied a lot because I was an overweight kid, had nappy hair, my uniform is dirty. I was a crybaby. I mean, you name it, they had something to tease me about, you know. And that experience really was my introduction to adversity. We we're going to talk about that diversity, but adversity, really overcoming challenges. And so being able to re being raised like that at St. Atherita, um, St. Atherita too with Chicago, Chicago is the most segregated city in the U.S. I mean, we, I didn't really come into contact with any other cultures besides the black culture. So you had the South Side, which is predominantly black, but with you having other, you know, you have the Irish neighborhood, you had the Italian neighborhood, you had the Polish immigrant neighborhood, and you had the Chicano Latino neighborhood, but never did we all integrate with each other, never. And so St. Atherita, my neighborhood used to be an all white neighborhood in the 50s and 60s and 70s. And then you had, and it's still like that today, but you'll have like every 20, 30 years, the neighborhood would shift and it would change. So I was a part of that change. My parents, when they bought the house in Chicago, it was, it was mixed, it was 50-50. But then by the time I got to school age, I went to St. Atherita, then the neighborhood changed, it was all black. But my school, we still had nuns, and they were able to whoop us, you know, <laughs> with the paddle. They had the rulers, and, uh, but we had white nuns, we had a white priest, we had few white teachers, predominantly black teachers, but all black students. And so that was my reality with diversity and inclusion. So as a young child, that's all I saw. I never was interacting with any other cultures growing up. And looking back on it, I, look, I remember one experience with um, me at St. Atherita. I had a weekend job. So I had my first job, like seventh grade. I was cutting grass for, the, for St. Atherita, for the campus there, and for the church, and for the school. And, and my first, um, I guess you can say, introduction to racism was I was about in seventh grade, and Father Nallen Say, hey, we're going to have lunch today with the staff. Can you, you know, come in and eat with us after you cut the grass? I'm like, cool. You know, I smelled it cooking. I'm like, yeah, I'm hungry anyway. That's, that's what's up, you know. So I go in, I go eat. And as soon as I sit down, actually, back up, <clears throat> as soon as I sit down, my heart rate started beating a little fast, right? And I'm sitting, I'm looking around the room, and I'm the only black person in the room. 
in the seventh grade, and that was my first time experiencing that. So, say, uh, you know, and Father Allen was a really nice guy. He was like, hey, yeah, Tommy, and you're doing great. And, you know, his staff was really nice people, you know. And the cook, <clears throat> excuse me, the cook would, kept, she kept looking at me, you know, staring at me and giving me these, I don't know, it was an evil eye or she wasn't happy that I was sitting at the table. I mean, and, and the rectory, Father Allen's house, the rectory was really nice, really beautiful mansion pretty much. And she was a part of the old... St. Atherita. And having this young black man sitting at the table, you, you can tell she didn't like that. And so when she served me, she kind of, you know, gave me these eyes. And I'm still seventh grader. I'm not knowing, you know, I'm not really feeling why she's like that. Or maybe she's just mean and grumpy. Well, as we started eating, she walked over to me in front of everybody and said, hey, I know you want bread. I know how you people like to eat bread with your, with your meal. Do you want bread? You know, you people like bread. She kept saying that over and over again. And Again, I'm still not thinking, but intrinsically, I knew something was up. I'm like, that don't sound right. I mean, that doesn't sound like she's loving, you know? So I go home, and my mom, I talk, talk to her about it, and I say, Mom, yeah, we ate, and, you know, and I'm talking about, of course, what we ate, because I was just a greedy kid, you know, so I'm talking about the, the, the meal. But then I said, Mom, she said, kept saying something to me. She kept calling, you know, talking about you people. She's saying you people every time she's asking about bread, and so my mother looked at me, she said, Tommy, you know what, let me tell you something. You know, there are going to be people in your life that's going to always, they're not going to be happy because of the color of your skin, and that's it. It's just because you're black, they're not going to like you for who you are. And she said, one thing I want to tell you is that you've got to remember who you are and whose you are, and being proud of that. One of those go with any other. Being proud of who you are and whose you are. That's what she used to always say to me. And so she said, whenever you feel like you're in that, that racist situation, you be proud of who you are. And, you, and you, know, you don't be disrespectful, but you don't lay your head down. You don't hang your head down. And so at the seventh, in seventh grade, that was my introduction to that. But that was kind of unique for me. I mean, growing up, it was, you know, Chicago. They had a problem with the KKK. They used to have these big rallies in Marquette Park Saturday afternoon. They would, you know, make these press conferences saying that if we see any black people in our neighborhood, we're going to chase them out after dark. I mean, it was, that was my reality growing up, but I never really experienced that. All I saw was that on the news, but that was my first time being introduced to that. So being able to go through that process on the weekends and, and working, um, you know, it, it was something that I knew that that was my reality at that point. And knowing that there were going to be people out there in, in the world that didn't like me for who I was. That was a problem. Even as a young child, I still had issues with that. And so knowing how can I be able to overcome that. So at that point, um, while attending the private school and, and being beat up and walking to and from school and being bullied and being bullied every day and being a crybaby and, you know, and my sister, I was responsible for her walking her to school. And, and I used to always have to say, Michelle, you go that way and go meet me in the parking lot of the school. I'm going to go around this way because this is where I knew the gang members would be waiting on me. So I couldn't have my little sister. And I keep saying little sister, she gets mad, but she's always going to be my little sister. She's 38 now, you know. So I knew that I couldn't have her walk over there with me. But that was my reality as far as being a victim of bullying. So I didn't really think about that until years later in my career working in Spokane. I saw kids being bullied a lot. And then it just hit me as far as this stuff is still going on. So how can we help with that? And I'm going to go into that a little bit later as far as what Operation Healthy Family does. But that was my, um, my world as far as being a victim of bullying and, and being a, not speaking up and walking into the school and having my uniform all ripped up and having marks on my face and teachers like, Tommy, what happened to you? And I'm like, oh, nothing, nothing happened. You know, I refused to speak up. I didn't tell my dad, didn't tell my mom. My sister didn't really know because she was younger. There was one incident that kind of shifted everything and these kids used to chase me home every day, you know. So one day I'm running through the alley and jumping over fences and everything, just trying to get back to my block. And I heard this car driving up behind them, speeding. And I'm like, man, they got a car chasing me now. I'm like, what the heck? You know, so I turn around, the guys that were chasing me, there was a car behind them and it was my dad's yellow Cadillac. It was him that was chasing them who were chasing me. So he pulls in front of them, slams on the brake, get in the car. And I'm like, yes, sir. I get in the car, my heart is beating fast, you know? So I get in the car, he's standing outside the car, and I'm looking through the windshield like, yeah, what, now what? You know, I'm all excited. You know, my pops showed up to save me. And that was him saving me from that. But he got in the car and he looked at me. He's like, Tommy, why didn't you tell me this was going on? And the first thing that came to my mind was I didn't want to be a snitch. And so that's what our youth are going through today is that they don't know how to speak up. 
they don't know that it's not about being a snitch, it's about helping people. So that was my introduction. I was, you know, being a victim of bullying at that point. So Santa Arturita, so now I grew, I shout out to be six foot four, this height in the eighth grade. I mean, I morphed. I mean, I don't even remember the summer of going into my eighth grade year because I slept that whole summer. I mean, literally, I ate and went to bed and my legs would hurt because my legs were stretching. I shot out to be six foot four in the eighth grade. So then kids started looking at me different. Those little gangbangers, they didn't look at me no more like that, you know? But I was still a big puppy. I really wasn't a fighter, you know? So I got a scholarship to go to Mendo Catholic High School. And um, back then, they couldn't, but well, they still can't now. But the, the, the Catholic school system there, the way, the way it goes is that they can't give you a football scholarship. They had me write this essay called the Leadership Scholarship. And I thought I was scholarly. I was like, yeah, you write a 500-word essay on what leadership means to you. And they only gave it to me and a couple other kids at St. Anthony in the eighth grade. And I'm like, this is awesome. I wrote this letter, and I'm writing drafts, and no typewriter, no computer. I'm just writing, you know, writing these drafts and everything. And, and uh, I got accepted. Mendel and all the other Catholic schools were like, yeah, we want to give you a leadership scholarship. I'm like, that's cool. I got a leadership scholarship. So that was a seed planted about leadership, right? So I get to Mendel. It's on the south side, too. Big old campus. Mendel was a huge school. And I get there. I remember the first day of football practice. I'm in the locker room, and I'm just proud. I'm like, yeah, I got the leadership scholarship. And all the other players are like, man, we all on leadership scholarships. That's, that's a football scholarship. I'm like, you know, for real. <laughs> you know? I'm like, man, shoot, man. I thought I was here on, a, you know, on some scholarly, man. I was proud. My mother's proud and everything else. But yeah, so I was there on a football scholarship in high school. Um, so I get to Mendel, and my freshman year, like I said, I shot up to six foot four. And then at that point, I was the first time I ever put on a helmet. I never played tackle football, ever, until high school. And then I became a good football player, and I, was, I liked to hit people legally on the field, you know, not on, in the streets, it was on the field. So sophomore year, coach said, Tommy, we want to put you on the varsity. Me and this other guy named Derek, we want to put both of you guys on the varsity. So this is like, it was bigger three times, it was like a Lewis and Clark High School, it was huge. So we had a freshman team, sophomore team, JV and a varsity. So my freshman year, instead of going into the sophomore team, I went up to the varsity. My head, ego, I mean, my head got so big, I was barely sitting, you know, fit in the room, you know? So at that point, all of the other students, the older kids, I started hanging out with the seniors. And all of my buddies, the freshmen, I stopped hanging out with them. I'm like, man, I'm on varsity. I can't really talk to y'all you know, in front of everybody, right? So at that point, my, the older students, the seniors, started teasing the younger freshmen, and they started bullying them. And they started beating them up. And they started throwing them on. We had a big pond in the middle of campus. And they would throw them in the pond, and they would just do all this stuff. And I'm sitting here with them. Now, I'm not taking part, you know, into the actual physical stuff, but I'm still, you know, jawing and talking and teasing them. And I didn't even realize that I used to be that person because I wanted to fit in so much. And that point in my life, it really changed. It shifted because later on that year, sophomore year, middle of school year, they were doing an investigation. I didn't even know. You know, dean of students, never forget his name, Father Shinowski, calls me to his office. And he's like, Tommy, we've been doing an investigation here on this campus. And there's a lot of bullying going on. And your name keeps coming up. Because I was on varsity as a sophomore, I, had, I didn't even know people were looking at me that closely, but they were. And so they did an investigation, and he said, Tommy, we're tired of giving you detentions. They called them ju jugs, justice under God. T tired of giving you jugs. Therefore, you are now expelled from school. I didn't even know what expelled meant. I'm like, okay, so two-day suspension? Three? No, I'm like, no, you need to leave campus now. You are now trespassing. You need to leave. Don't even go to your locker. We're going to call your parents. We're going to tell them we sent you home. My world, I mean, literally, it blew up right in front of my face. So not only did I mess up an opportunity, all the guys I played with played at Notre Dame, Michigan, Michigan State, Iowa. Those are my teammates. Played in the NFL. So my decision at that point, it ruined it. And so I tell students today, and, I, and what I'm saying to you is what I talk, how I talk to students in my assemblies, is that them have an opportunity to do the right thing, to be the reactor is what we call it, be the reactor. We have the bully, we have the victim, you have the bystander. But I created a role called the reactor because students, they want to be a snitch. They didn't want to be a tattleteller. So I'm like, how can we create some positive? So I said, we're going to call a reactor. God gave me the vision. I'm like, yeah, reactor. You're a reactor. And I'm like, okay, what is reactor? You know, but it's not a snitch. That means you're going to do some positive. You're going to speak up. So I got expelled. I had to go to public school. Not, there was nothing wrong with that. But in Chicago, there was something wrong with that. 
the public school system there even today is it's not good. So I have to go transfer to Hyde Park Career Academy and Kenwood was around the corner. That's where Michelle Obama went. She went to Kenwood. I went to Hyde Park. We didn't know each other, but their school was really rich and, you know, higher influence and ours was down to earth a little bit, you know. And when I went to Hyde Park, went to this public school, and at that point, my whole, I didn't even know what to do at that point. I was all so used to being pampered in this other little sheltered world. I get to Hyde Park, don't know how to act, my grades slip. Um, I was still a good football player. There were guys before me that barely went to class, b barely got D's, and they went on to play college football. I'm like, cool, I don't really have to go to class. I'm gonna do what they did, right? Didn't go to class, hanging out with the wrong people, and there was a thing in my senior year called Prop 48. It was the first year they came out with Prop 48. And that meant that you were a non-qualifier if you didn't have your, your grades and your SAT had to match. I had neither. <laughs> so I tried to take the ACT. I tried that in my senior year, middle of my senior year, I tried to become a good student. And it was too late. It was way, teachers were la laughing at me. I'm like, what can I do to get my grade up? They was like, go back to two years ago. I mean, you got to literally stop doing what you're doing. And so... I didn't know what to do. So I was going to join the Air Force. So I was like, I'm going to the Air Force. Because my parents, were, was, two things are going to happen. Either you're going to go to school, no, three things. Either you're going to go to school, you're going to go get a job, or you're going into the service. Those are the three options you have in this house. So you've got to choose what you're going to do. So I said, well, school, I'm not really a good student. You know, I really didn't like to work that much because I was just playing football. So I said, I'm just going to go into the service. Went to the Air Force. Took the test. I was going to take the physical. I said, okay, you know, this is cool. So I'm sitting on the porch. I took the exam, I'm sitting on my porch. And I'm like, well, you know what? And I'm just sitting there praying like, Lord, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't, really don't want to go into the service. I really don't want to do this, but I'm already, I already signed up for it. My best friend, two doors down, Dwayne Harris, walking down the street. I'm like, Dwayne, where are you going? Early in the morning. He said, I'm going to this community college called Moraine Valley Community College. I'm like, community college? I said, do they have a football team? He's like, yeah. I was like, hold on. I'm going to the house. Change, go with them, get on the city bus, the suburban bus, take the bus out to Moraine Valley Community College, made a beeline. I, didn't, I went past financial aid and admissions. I went right to the football office, right? Priorities. Go right to the football office <laughs> and uh, talk to the coach. And he's like, uh, yeah, you know, just got to register for 15 credit hours and practice, go get a physical, practice is on Monday. I'm like, okay, this is my opportunity to change my life, right? So I get home, tell my parents this is Friday. I'm going to Moraine Valley Community College. I can play college football. And they're like, okay, well, that sergeant is coming here tomorrow to pick you up to go get you sworn in. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. Can you tell him I'm not going to go? And he was like, no, you're going to tell him you're not going to go. So the sergeant came there from the Air Force, and he sits in my living room, and I'm telling him. And I really didn't want to say anything to him. I want my mom and dad to kind of say it to him. And they were like, no, you're going to tell him that you're not going. And so I did. Finally broke it down. We sat in my living room for like three, four hours, and there were guys in the truck, too, waiting on him. I'm like, he really wanted me to... I don't know if they got paid per head or something. I don't know, but he had an incentive to get me in the car, right? And so um, I didn't do it. Played in Moraine Valley, really successful there. Academically, I still struggled. And years later, come to find out, I had a learning disability in elementary school. I could barely, I mean, reading and comprehension didn't match for me. And I was a different student. I couldn't read a book and then take a test. I couldn't do that. I had to have, have you talk to me, and then I would listen with headphones and write notes. I, had, I was a different student, but I didn't really find that out until Eastern, until I came here. My junior year is when I really found out how to be a student. But so I, I finished community college, and all the colleges that wanted me in high school still were trying to get me, and, but I still couldn't figure it out academically, and so I had to get my associate's degree and couldn't do that on time. And so all of these schools were coming to my community college. Now I commuted back and forth to, it's like, you know, North Idaho Community College to Spokane. So I commuted back and forth. So those colleges would come to my community college and talk to me there, tell me we want to give you a scholarship. And I'm like, yeah, cool. And, you know, tell your parents this is what we got for you. Then we got a call from this coach named J.D. Sollers from Eastern Washington University, right? So J.D. calls my college coach and says, hey, we want to get Tommy. We really like what he's doing. And, so then he calls me and he said, Tommy, we want to come and visit you. I'm like, yeah, well, just meet me on campus. And they said, no, we want to come visit your parents. We want to come to your house. I'm like, man, don't come to my house. Just come talk to me. I make the decisions, right? <laughs> I'm the one playing. You don't need to talk to them. I tell them where I'm going, you know? He said, no, we want to come to your house. So J.D. was, I don't know if you might remember him, but J.D. had blonde hair. He was a surfer dude, you know, just really surfer-looking cat and had on a Hawaiian shirt and 
khaki shorts and flip-flops. And so he's driving on the south side of Chicago, right? This is before cell phones. Pulls over on 79th Street, calls me from the pay, pay phone. Hi, Tommy. Uh, yeah, J.D. Solis here. Yeah, I'm on 79th in uh, Halstead. Um, so where's your house located? I said, J.D., get back in the car right now. Get back in the car. I said, I will come to you and I will follow you to my house. You can follow me to my house. So he comes to my house, talking to my, my parents, and, and he's Eastern Washington, Eastern Washington. And mind you, I don't know anything about, you know, the only thing I knew was South Side of Chicago, Chicago. That's all I knew. Eastern Washington, okay, Washington, D.C. That's what I'm thinking, right? Washington, D.C. I'm like, okay, I'll go to Maryland. That's cool. I'll go back there. That's all right. Yeah, cool. So I go on a recruiting trip, get on the plane, United Airlines, true story, United Airlines, open it up, look at the map. I'm like, D.C., Eastern, Cheney, Cheney. And I'm like, Spokane, what the heck? Where is Spokane, you know? And I'm like 18, 19, and I'm like tripping there. And I'm like, where am I going, you know? <laughs> where am I going, you know? So I get off the plane, you know, and uh, green, evergreen trees everywhere. And this was in 91. So a little bit different now. Um, so we get to downtown Spokane, and this was the old bus station, so we driving down the street, and I see that old bus station, it was like an old Shaft movie from the 70s, I mean, I saw jerry curls, I saw, you know, wide collar, you know, suits, and, and I'm like, man, I'm looking at people like, I am not coming here, they're like, so Tommy, you like that? I'm like, yeah, this is cool, yeah, uh-huh, <laughs> I'm like, I ain't coming here, but yeah, this, yeah, this is cool, this is cool, you know. So they take me to CI Shenanigans, right? Little nice restaurant. We sit down, we talk, and I'm like, okay, Spokane, it's a city. I'm like, all right, I can do this. It's a city. I'm thinking about it, all right? So it's like, okay, now we're gonna go to Cheney. <laughs> They're like, what you mean we're gonna go to Cheney? I thought we, Cheney is a neighborhood or something. They're like, no, we're gonna go to Cheney now. So they get in the car. I'm sitting in the car, and I'm like, man, where are we going? Sun is going down. We're on 90, right? Sun is all the way down now get off, Four Lakes, and then I'm like, I am not coming here, man. So we're driving into Cheney, it's dark, and I'm looking at, I'm like, in city boy, I'm city boy, I'm, you know, I'm light, street, you know, everything, high rise. So I'm getting into Cheney, and I'm like, I am really, I mean, and this was 91. We had Ben Franklin, McDonald's, the gas station, and that was about it, you know, so that was it, right? So I'm getting here, and and I'm thinking, I'm like, there's no way. And so, recruiting trip, right? Go through air, go through, jump through the hoops. Yeah, this is cool. I love it. Yeah, good facilities. Yeah, this is awesome. I get back on the plane, come home. My parents are like, we just got off the phone with JD, and you're going to Eastern. And I'm like, I'm not going to Eastern. Like, yes, you are going to Eastern. <laughs> it's uh, what she say? It's it's a three-hour plane drive, and no, three-hour plane ride. And she said it's a 20-hour drive. So that means you're not coming home every weekend. So that means you're going to Eastern. So hence, I, I was coming to Eastern, right? <clears throat> get off, get here, junior year, I'm angry because, I mean, I love it now, Eastern. I'm, a, I'm an eagle through and through now, but it grew on me because diversity kicked in. Inclusion kicked in, right? So 91, when you walked around the campus, people looked at you and they, two things, were you in the service or what sport do you play? Those are the two questions I got asked over and over again, and I just did not like that. It really got me angry. I'm like, no, I'm, I'm on a tennis scholarship. I'm like, just tell them anything, you know, golf. You know, I know I look like I ate somebody, you know, I'm just up here big. I'm like, yeah, I'm, you know, but that was my introduction to, to diversity and, uh, or lack thereof at that point. And my introduction to it in the, on the college campus, and I majored in criminal justice, and it was kind of nice to go past uh, right here. This is Hargraves, right? So criminal justice used to be housed here. So Crim J was right here in this building, and I remember me and my, all my friends, my football buddies, we always went, we talked about FBI, DEA, because that sounded really cool. Full, you know, you see those guys, you know, they look all big. I'm like, I already got the physique. I'm just going to go ahead and major in criminal justice, right? So all my friends were like, we're going to major in criminal justice. Like, it's cool. So me and it was like only about eight black guys on the team pretty much at that point. So all of us, all eight of us registered, right? Intro to Criminal Justice 101, we're excited. Professor Monahan comes into class in the auditorium and he looks around and he said, okay, I wanna tell you guys something. This is the first year we've had this many students major in criminal justice. So I'm gonna tell you right now, this is gonna be the hardest class you've ever taken in your life. 
So I'm giving you guys an opportunity to go ahead and you know, drop this class and go into some other class. All my buddies were like, I'm dropping, I'm dropping, I'm dropping. And for some reason, that was a challenge for me. And I took it racially. I thought he was talking to me because I'm a black kid, right, from Chicago, and I took that as, how dare you tell me that I can't be in this program? So that was my introduction to, to really being a student athlete. So well, I struggled, I mean, majoring in criminal justice here, I mean, the way they did it, they were trying to get you ready for pre-law. So those classes, I mean, it was, I mean, people were getting Ds and they were like, I got a D, you know, because the majority of the play had to, that's when I found out about grading on the curve at that point. But they really made you into being more going into Gonzaga law. That's what they were preparing us for. But for me to go through that and having that professor tell me that and taking it that way, that really allowed me to know that I needed to make a decision on who I was and how I was going to show people as a black man walking around Cheney and how I was going to carry myself and how I was going to, and then I thought about people that went before me, right? I'm all, I, I like history and I love history. And, and when I first got out to the Northwest and, and um, looking at how, how did black people get here? What, what did we do when we came out here? And, and then Lewis and Clark, right? Everybody's talking about Lewis and Clark, Lewis and Clark. Well, years ago, my, my ex-wife and my, my two boys in Lapway, Idaho, on the Nesperce Indian Reservation, I used to live on the Nesperce Reservation. And there was a guy, Jeff Guillory, who was my mentor, and uh, Jeff and his son, Professor Raphael Guillory, that, that goes, that's a professor here, um, Jeff pulled me to the side when I first got there, and he gave me a book called um, Black Indians by William Katz. And I started reading this book, and it really opened my eyes to the Northwest and how we had our hands into what it became today. And then I started reading about this guy named York. And York was a slave of Lewis, I think. And York was, you know, York was given to Lewis at a young, his little playmate to grow up with. And so York began the expedition from the east to the west. And so York was the man they would send ahead of them. York, go to the next village and tell them we're coming. And they'll see if York comes back alive, and they'll say, okay, let's go. You know, York was six foot two, six foot three, and back then that was huge. He was a giant, and he spoke many dialects of native languages. Him and Sacagawea were partnered together, and so York would pick up these languages and go into the next village and speak their dialect, which was something that was unheard of. So for me, thinking back on it, I'm like, how can I be a person that's, that's discouraged or feeling that I can't make it because York didn't have any, anybody to help him. It was him. So for me, looking back on it, I had to figure out a way to really make this into something that would be able to help the future people coming into Eastern. And now it's kind of, it, it makes me feel good because back then playing football, um, and I always talk about this, we were uh, sponsored by Pony. Anybody remember Pony? Wow, nobody. Pony was a shoe company that was very uh, uh, unique in that um, their shoes hurt your feet. <laughs> and, uh, but that's what we were sponsored by. Now you think, you know, Eastern is sponsored by who? Adidas. And I'm like, are you kidding me? So all the guys I played with we were like, yeah, we hope you guys get Adidas, man. You know how many feet that we have to go through, you know, shoes and feet were hurting. But now thinking about it full circle and seeing where Eastern is today, and I'm not taking the credit for any of this. I'm just saying that I'm glad that I stuck it out. I'm glad that Eastern became my home. I'm glad that I stuck out with criminal justice and, and allowed that to be my guide as far as going into education. And then years later, going into the master's program at WSU when I was the football counselor for when they went to the Rose Bowl. I worked with Mike Leaf and I'm not, uh, uh, Michael, yeah, uh, Ryan Leaf, sorry, Ryan Leaf and Michael Black and worked with those guys and being their counselor. And then I got into grad school and getting my master's and doing those things, but thinking back on my childhood and having a learning disability and not being taught at an early age on how to catch that and really how to divide on how to really learn good study habits and everything else, it really changed who I was today. And so that, looking back on that, I'm excited to know that we have come full circle a little bit. Now when I come on campus, come back to Cheney, I see students of color that are here to go to school. Now, they probably don't get that question too often. I don't know, I don't wanna speak for everybody, but they probably don't get that question too often of, what do you play? What sport do you play, right? Were you in the service? I mean, now it's, 
I'm majoring in education. I'm here to go to school because that's what Eastern has evolved into. We are now one of the powerhouses in football. Now people in Chicago know Eastern Washington University, which I was so excited because at first I'm like, Eastern, man, what Cheney, where's, are y'all D3? And that used to get me so angry. I'm like, no, we're not D3, you know? But now they know who we are and they are excited for us. Red Turf put us on the map. Who would ever thought, right? Now all I gotta say is Red Turf. I'm like, oh yeah, I know Eastern, I know Eastern. And that's really cool. But now we gotta, we gotta really attack this two, word, two words of diversity and inclusion. We gotta get that together and making sure that this campus can represent our students, represent our community, encourage students to wanna to be a professor here at Eastern instead of getting their degree and leaving the community. We want to be able to make sure that this is a campus that everybody wants to be a part of, not to just get a really good education and then go outside and go to Seattle, nothing in Seattle, but go to Seattle or anything else. We want them to stay here. We want them to be right here in Cheney and Spokane to be able to teach our youth. So today, um, my wife and I, Paula, we co-founded um, Operation Healthy Family, which is a nonprofit organization. And the reason we started this was off of our passion to work with people. And with me, it was football and it was social justice, being bullied a lot and having students being bullied. So I was like, well, we got to do something different. We got to be able to help students out with this. So with Operation Healthy Family, our mission is to honor God, follow Christ, and serve our community by helping families, by creating programs that can help strengthen the family unit. And we do that by partnering with other like-minded nonprofit organizations, businesses, and churches. So the three programs we have, we have Reactor Nation, which is our anti-bullying, which I don't call it that anymore. It's called a social connection program, because anti-bullying is negative, and I don't like negative words. So it's a social connection program, which Reactor Nation. And then we also have an athletic component, which is a basketball program called Ballers Athletics, which is an AAU, YMCA, helping develop kids and learning our five core values of honesty, respect, integrity, sportsmanship, and leadership, because it's beyond sports. Um, and our other two programs is Brush for the Future, which Paula's in charge of. She, we have students brushing their teeth every day in school, which I never thought that you know kids don't really think about. I didn't think of it, but now our sons are thinking about that every day. And we also have a dental access partnership program, which offers dental treatment to Medicaid patients, Medicaid clients in the community, because everybody has access, right? Everybody has access to healthcare, access to healthcare, but try to go to a dentist and bring them that card. They look at that card and like, oh, we don't take Medicaid, sorry. So what we do is we partner with private dentists and allow them to partner with us, and we work with that population to get them into the chairs to making sure that they can receive good ethical, dental treatment, and it's different from going to a community dentist and a private dentist. I've been in both. When you go to a community health, nothing against community health, they don't treat you as you go to a private dentist. You go to a community dentist, you know, they sit there, they do the work, and you get out. Go to a private dentist, they give you headphones, give you a nice blanket, watch movie, nitrous, no. I mean, they give you everything, right? <laughs> so that's where we are today, and I want to um, make sure that back to that that two-word system, diversity and inclusion, and knowing that we've come a long way at Eastern, but we still have a long way to go. And this week, I would like to see it be more than just a week. I wanna see it being spread out to make it to be a mission of who we are as Eagles within the community. You know, I was a part of WSU, and people say, oh, you're, you know, you're a Coug? I'm like, no, I'm an Eagle, you know? So I'm an Eagle at heart. But I wanna make sure that we can make this be a place that all students, feel like they are a part of something, no matter who you are, no matter what background you come from. Black, white, Chicano, Latino, Native American. I mean, we wanna make sure when they come up onto the Cheney campus that they feel like they belong. And so this week is something that we're gonna to do to kick off to make sure that all of our staff, everybody here can be a part of that mission. And so one thing I like to do too is um, every, at the end of all of our, um, actually I'm gonna back up a little bit. So it was some challenges, right? They wanted me to talk about challenges and what are some of the challenges I had when I came here on campus. And I talked about those a little bit, but what do you do? And even to Eastern students, they wanted me to talk about uh, how do you handle challenges facing diversity and inclusion? And I had three things. The first one, right? Don't take offense to everything. Give people the benefit of the doubt. Don't be offended. When somebody says something to you and it may be 
to where is it something that maybe not be too PC, right, or feeling as though they're talking about your race or anything else, try to give them a pass a little bit, a little bit of grace, and educate them in that process. Because there are times when people need to know. They don't know. I mean, Jeff Giller and I, we do training about um, it's more of you having an unintentional bias. We all have biases. And they're, maybe, they're unintentional, right? So as a student here on campus, how do you deal with the challenges with that? Is to one, don't take offense. Two, allow grace to be your guide. Grace, 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 right? Because there are some times when people automatically expect that you won't give them grace just because of how you look and how you act. That's a great opportunity to teach them who you are and where you come from. A third one is to remember that your journey here at Eastern is only a street to the highway of life, and you need to enjoy the drive. Enjoy this time here, right? Because once you leave here, and I'm 45 now, and I'm thinking back to my Eastern days, I'm like, man, I wish I could go back and just, you know, smell the grass a little bit more and, you know, and just go to Tawanka and, you know, eat in a, they still have Tawanka here, right? All right, cool, all right. I said it, you guys were like, Tawanka, well, you know. But go back in Tawanka and just eat and, and hang out with my, my buddies because that's over with now, you know? And, but you have to really enjoy the drive because there are a lot of times when it's over, it's over. Um, and another thing, too, they ask, too, as far as with our faculty and staff and alum, how, what can we do to do more to foster an inclusive environment? And I would say the first thing is to get to know your unintentional biases of, of different cultures. Get to know what they are. You know, don't assume anything about a certain culture. Ask questions, you know. If they have a head wrap on, ask about that head wrap. If they, you know, whatever their customs are, get to know what those customs are. Just don't think that you don't have to ask questions because you think that they may be offended. So number two is to when you make a mistake, it's okay to verbalize your shortcomings. It's, if you slip up, oh man, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to call it that. How do, how, do I, how do I talk about those things? You know, how can I get to know that culture in that way? That's how you get to learn. Some people, when they make a mistake, they walk away like, oh man, I'm never, never gonna talk to them again, right? Because they feel bad about it. But it's okay to make a mistake. And the third thing I would say is to get to know your students of color and not assume that you know their struggles as being a student of color on campus. Don't assume that you know what they're going through. Don't just jump to the end, oh yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know, yeah, 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 black, yeah, I understand, yeah, yeah. So here, this is what you do. No, be quiet and listen to your students. Allow them to tell you what their struggles are, because I guarantee you, just because I'm black, I don't know everything about black people, right? Don't assume that you think that they know everything about them. It's every person's struggle with racism and every person's struggle with inclusion and diversity is different. So take the time to get to know what that is for that student. So I'm getting to the end. And what I like to do is I like to make sure that um, we all can become one, right? So I always do this little talk with my students at the end of my assemblies. And, and so I like to make sure that we all can be as one. Okay, so it's a little affirmation time. Is everybody okay with that? All right, so everybody raise their right hand. Say, I am an eagle today. today. Let's start over because I don't like the energy with that. <laughs> you guys are, I am an eagle today. Let's go to Missoula and ask them about that, right? I guarantee you, yeah, exactly. Okay, then. That's what I got to say, right? So everybody raise their right hand. I am an eagle today. I am an eagle today. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Together as one. Together as one. Is the motto I will follow. Is the I will follow. I will lead by example. I will lead by example. To each one. To each one. I will teach one. I will teach one. Eagle for life. All right, and that's my time. I thank you so much. <laughs>